afternoon. I keep trying to say Sunday. It's going to, it's going to get me over the next 24 hours, Mayte. We're just over 24 hours from kickoff because it's Saturday afternoon at one o'clock at Bill's Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. And as your questions are coming in, just put them right there in the comments and I'll serve all those up. And Mayte has his, you know, encyclopedia of analysis and prep and stats and everything ahead of this awesome matchup between the Indianapolis Colts and the Buffalo Bills. But as we're getting some of those questions coming in, I want to refer back to what's behind me the snow game that you were a part of it's certainly not going to look anything like this in buffalo this weekend it's going to be a little bit cold i think the forecast calls for you know maybe high 20s low 30s but thankfully no snow no precipitation because mate you were on the field for this one you you lived it I try to thank you because I try to block that out of my memory so thank you for for bringing that back into the recesses of my mind but uh yeah, I mean, by the third quarter of that game, you know, I was rendered useless, even more than I already am, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> all my gear was was wet, and um, you know, it was it was uh, it was a it was it's certainly a, a fascinating game because I mean, not uh, not to to get into it too much, but I mean, it it literally snowed about eight nine inches in about a thirty minute span from the time the guys went into the locker room. From when they came back out, there was at least six inches on the field. That's how nuts that game was and, and the conditions. So, um, you know, it's funny. Frank Gore ran the ball 30 times in that game. Uh, I think LaShawn McCoy ran it like 40 times in that game. I mean, well, yeah, because you couldn't throw it. I mean, you, you it, couldn't. It just there was disappears. no footing. There was no. no footing. There was no footing in that game. So, thankfully, we go back to Buffalo in the months of, you know, December and January with much more pleasant of a forecast on the horizon here. The only two trips I've gotten to make for to Buffalo were both in preseason games. And I, I just don't <laughs> expect that I've gotten the full experience of you Buffalo in August, you know, I've, as, I've as never been, <laughs> I've never been more cold in my life because I mean, we, we, the, the game was over the Colts lost and then we were in the locker room and I, I didn't bring adequate like change of gear. So I was in like moist and damp stuff on the plane oh. ride home. <laughs> So I didn't get home till like what, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night. And I was just shivering cold for the next like three days after that. I can't even fathom. And it'll certainly be a different experience this weekend in that, you know, Bill's mafia will only be about 6,700 <laughs> strong instead of the, the typical thousands and tens of thousands that you're used to seeing there. But it is interesting that the Buffalo Bills are hosting their first playoff game in 25 years. This will be the first time this season they're allowed to have fans. There's a whole process that those who are attending the game have to go through. They had to either be tested there at, at the facility or at the, uh, at the stadium on Thursday or show proof of getting um, a negative COVID test. And then, there, of course, everyone's spread out. So if there were ever a year to capitalize on being a road team in the playoffs, 2020 to 2021 would be that opportunity. So getting a few questions in here, Terry wants to know, can we expect a more run centered offense this week, especially in the second half? Certainly that's one of the things when you look at very few weaknesses with the Buffalo bills, but they have not been particularly great against the run. No, they haven't, you know, for the entire year, they're kind of middle of the road in most defensive categories. Although in the last five or six games, just like the Colts offense, their defense is kind of surging. But for the most part, for the entirety of you know a 16-game regular season, their defense has kind of been middle of the road. They're giving up uh, over the course of 16 games, four and a half yards per carry. They've allowed over 100 yards eight times and over 200 yards twice. So they can be had, and I think this kind of goes right in line with what you have to do well in order to have success in January football, Larry. You've got to be able to run the ball. And right now, the Colts are the third best rushing team in the NFL in their last five games, averaging about 170 yards in that span. And last Sunday kind of speaks for itself, over 250 as a team. Jonathan Taylor sets the all-time record for rushing yards uh, by a running back in a single game in franchise history. So they're kind of they're kind of hitting their stride at the right time, and they're going to need to run the ball well against this this front coming up on, on Saturday because um, I, I think I think you know. I know this wasn't the question, but I think you need to shrink the game a little bit against this offense that Buffalo has because Josh Allen and company, they set all kinds of records, you know, points, yards, passing yards this season in franchise history. I mean, they're one of the best offenses in the NFL going on right now. 
you know, putting up about 38 points per game in their last five. So I think you need to shrink the game a little bit. Their offense is really good in terms of time of possession. The Colts need to steal a page from their playbook. They need to possess the ball, I would say, 35, 36 minutes in this game to have a chance to kind of shrink the game, limit Allen's opportunities to get the ball to Diggs and Beasley, guys like that, his top playmakers. Um, so kind of the same blueprint that you, you've you used in the recent past to beat some marquee teams like Green Bay, Kansas City in 2019, uh, you know, the, the Houston Texans in 2018 in the playoffs. You need to run the ball well, and you need to, you know, to, to control the ball a lot in terms of time of possession. Stu Let's see. We're going to go to Tyler's question next. He says, how does T.Y. match up with the Bills? I think pretty good. You know, I think they have some really solid uh, cornerbacks. You know, Tredavious White was an all-pro guy a couple years ago. He's a back-to-back -back pro bowler. So I think that's going to be the matchup. I think that's going to be the matchup on T.Y. Hilton. Um, but that's the thing about this team, you know, all year long, you know, in years past, we've said, you know, T.Y. has to have a really big game in order for the, the Colts to have a chance to win. You know, that's no, that's no longer a prerequisite because of the, mm -hmm. the depth they have all over the offense. Enter at, at Zach receiver, Pascal, tight end. And so exactly. Michael, Michael Pittman, enter Trey Burton. I mean, it's, you know, you we, can we've pick a seen, different guy week to week. Yeah, to, not to beat a dead horse, because I think we talk about this every single week, but Zach Pascal has had a 100-yard game this season. Same thing is true for uh, Michael Pittman, Mo Alley Cox. So I think Tredavious White is going to be matched up on T.Y. Hilton. But so long as you're running the ball well and you're controlling the clock and you're winning time of possession and you're being efficient on first and second down, which I think is huge in this game, then I don't think you know T.Y. Hilton not going off for 150 yards should play all that big of a uh, matter in this ball game. Now, flip side, this is a compelling conversation over the course of the week is whether you'll see the two former Minnesota Vikings in terms of Stefan Diggs and Xavier mm -hmm. Rhodes. And that is Rudy's questions. He said, could we see Rhodes playing man versus Diggs? And that's one thing that I asked Darius Leonard this week is, is along this line is I asked him, how much are you, you guys picking as a defense? Xavier's brain from those many seasons that they spent together and all of the familiarity that he would have. Of course, it's a different offense now you know that that Diggs is in in Buffalo and he said that X has just been completely locked in watching film all week he said I didn't even want to bother him uh he's got you know so much that he's going to be tasked with this week that I didn't want to mm -hmm. throw anything else else at him but that is something that's kind of interesting to um to kind of prognosticate is if we will see that matchup what do you think yeah, I think we'll see it some. I don't think we'll see it exclusively because that's not the Colts' M.O. They really don't do that under Matt Eberflus. I think, obviously, you know, situational, you know, game on the line or third down or crunch time red zone, then I think, you know, you want to put your best cover corner, which is Xavier Rhodes this season. In fact, he has the second best completion percentage rate allowed this season among all qualified cornerbacks. So he's having a terrific year. Um, so I think you're going to see situationally he'd be matched up on Stefan Diggs. But I think the Colts go back to playing a little bit more press man-to-man -man, uh, coverage, some tight windows for Josh Allen to throw the ball to uh, in, in this game. So um, I think you'll see it some but I doubt you'll see it exclusively. I don't think it's going to be a shadow situation because the Colts just don't do that. They haven't done that in the past when they played the Texans, you know, with DeAndre Hopkins. They didn't do that when they played, you know, a guy like Parker uh, for the for the Green Bay Packers. So uh, I think it's all kind of matchup oriented in situational football as to when you decide to kind of pick the brain and go to the matchup with Xavier and Stephon Diggs. This is a broader question that Stewart serves up. He says on the defensive side of the ball, what do the Colts have to do to slow down Josh Allen and that Bills offense? Great question because not many teams have been able to do it in 2020 with as high powered as, as this offense is. And one of the mm -hmm. things that Justin Houston mentioned about Josh Allen, he of course has a great arm. He's also, you know, pretty, he, he has the ability to extend plays with his feet and then he's really tough to take down. I mean, he's that he's a bigger guy who does have some escapability. Yeah, interior pressure from DeForest Buckner. That's huge. You have to get that in this game tomorrow to have a chance to slow him down. And then I think you just have to play complimentary along that entire defensive line. I think this is a really big game for guys like Justin Houston and Danico Autry to set the edge because, to your point, Josh Allen is like a tight end out there with the ball in his hands because he's he's as agile and as athletic as a guy. 
that's not a quarterback. You know, he's kind of deceptively uh, athletic with the ball in his hands, um, but he's got just this bazooka, this cannon of a right arm, and he can throw the ball from all these different arm angles. He's kind of like a shortstop with just a really, really big arm. He can put the ball anywhere on the field in the offensive backfield. So you got to keep him in the pocket. And then DeForest Buckner, which we hope that hopefully he plays. He's questionable as of right now going into the game. Knock on wood that he will. But I think he has to be a really big force on the inside in this game. Get that interior pressure so that Allen has nowhere to go with the football uh, when things kind of break down. And he's so good at improvising, getting outside on the edge, either right or left and looking for his top two targets in Cole Beasley and Stephon Diggs. And meanwhile, speaking of injury reports, and you're talking about questionable for DeForest Buckner, we've seen Stephon Diggs limited in practice this week with that oblique injury. Appears that he he would play, but Cole Beasley missed last week. He's one who's been on their injury report as well. So some issues there that we'll look to see on the the as mm-hmm. uh, kickoff approaches in terms of their availability. I would fully expect probably both of them to play, but you do wonder if there's going to be any limitations or differences in how they they utilize those guys. I'm going to kind of lump these next two questions together, and you can hit on them as you, as you wish, Mayte. But Joshua asks, how will the Colts stop the Bills' efficiency with third and fourth down completions? And then Glenn asks, will the Colts blit more? Why do we never blitz? I don't know if never. I think it's very it's selectively, I would say, not never, but... Yeah, the Colts don't blitz because they win their one-on-one matchups in the front four. And so when you can do that, when you get sufficient and efficient uh, pressure with your front four, then you don't have to bring an extra guy and sacrifice Mm -hmm. things in the back end and coverage. So that's why you don't do it. Now, when the Colts have had problem doing that, that's when they bring guys like Darius Leonard or off the edge with Kenny Moore and so on and so forth. Um, so we'll see kind of how that plays out. But yeah, I think winning first and second down in this game is going to be monstrous to put the Bills in third and long. They are the number one team, Lara, in third down conversions. And a reason why is because they're in a lot of third and short. They win first and second down to help themselves win third down. And so that kind of goes back to my time of possession comment earlier. They're number one on third down, which leads to them being number three in time of possession. They possess the ball a lot. So I think your offense has to play some defense in this game. Again, win time of possession when you're on the field, limit the chances of Josh Allen when he's out there. I mean, it's kind of like 2019 Sunday night football, Colts on the road to Kansas City. Colts had the ball for 37 minutes in that game. They ran the ball for 180 yards. Marlon Mack went over 100. But, you know, Patrick Mahomes was so good. He was still so good in that game, still passed for 300 yards. But guess what? They only scored 13 points, and it's because they had two or three less possessions. The Colts have to limit the opportunities to score for this Bills team by getting either a couple of red zone stops or a takeaway or two on defense to kind of help in that regard so that they're not putting up 30 points on you know eight or nine possessions. Yeah, the takeaway battle is going to be huge, of course, in this. I mean, it always is, but but in particular, if this Colts defense can yeah. force some takeaways, force uh, you know this this Bills offense to kind of be back in their heels a bit and they get points off of turnovers, could be significant on su- Saturday afternoon. I keep wanting to say Sunday. <laughs> it's been so ingrained in my mind. I got to go back to my college football reporting yeah. days and talk about Saturday afternoons. Time for just a few more as we're wrapping this edition of Horseshoe FAQ up for the week. Nathaniel, how does their D-line match up with our O-line? Notably, it does look like Jared Valdir will be back at left tackle this Mm -hmm. week, um, which it's the luxury now of having a full week with this team. After last week, he he said that he came in and really only had Thursday and Friday before playing in that game against Jacksonville. So, man, having a full week and a half now probably feels like an eternity. Yeah, even without Anthony Costanzo, I think that's a favorable matchup for the Colts. You know, they're solid. They've got Ed Oliver. Vernon Butler has been kind of a a role player for the most part in his career. He's taken on a starting uh, duty these last couple of games of the regular season. Um, But he's not going to be confused, Lara, with, you know, Aaron Donald or or DeForest Buckner lining up, you know, a defensive tackle or nose tackle. Jerry Hughes on the outside, Mario Addison. They're not a huge – you know, pressure team, you know, those guys, I think Hughes has four sacks. Addison has five and a half. So decent numbers, but these are guys that I don't think they're going to keep you up at night. Right. I mean, I think you can win your one-on-one matchups, especially on the edges. Veld here proved that 
he can hang up or, you know, kind of hold his own given that, again, like you said, practice only twice last week. He kind of crunched to get up to speed in this playbook. So he looks more than serviceable at left tackle. And then Braden Smith is one of the best right tackles in the game. So he should hold up on the outside. I think the Colts should be able to run the ball pretty decently um, in this game tomorrow. And hopefully they get off to a really good start doing that because, you know, we've talked about all these different things the Colts have to do to win the game. I think one of them, another layer is get off to a hot start, right? And, and take, uh, take it to the Bills right from the get-go. The Colts have scored – Uh, on six straight opening possessions, so kind of set the tone early. Another thing is run the ball well from the get-go. Jonathan Taylor kind of established him early and often. The Colts are 6-1 and this season, Lara, when he has at least 15 carries in a game. So the more you can feed him, obviously the more – it's all kind of just one big, like, piece of the pie, part of the equation, right? I've talked about win time of possession, win, be good on third down. All of those things kind of stem from the running game. So if you can do that with Jonathan Taylor and get those carries up, he's obviously a back that gets better as the game goes along, just like most great ones. So hopefully you can do those things from the outset, establish a line of scrimmage and run the ball efficiently starting in the first quarter. Well, we are getting ready now just, what, 25 hours or so away from kickoff in Buffalo. Saturday afternoon, 105 kickoff there in Orchard Park, New York. And it is going to be fun. I know that this is something that's been heavily discussed this week. Just Frank Reich going back to Buffalo. That's always something that is exciting for him to go back to a place that was so significant to his own football career, a place where, you know, he played so many incredible games, including that that comeback, of course, that everyone talks about and then of course he's coached in situations there in Buffalo as well so I'm certainly excited to see this one unfold on Saturday afternoon we will be on the Bell Tire radio network so join myself Rick Venturi and of course the voice of the Colts Matt Taylor tomorrow afternoon this is a wrap for this edition of Horseshoe FAQ wildcard weekend Horseshoe FAQ have a great Blue Friday and a great game day go Colts